Hi everyone, Marco here from University of Oviedo. In the following, I will present some grip experiments on ice with in situ follow up of string field that I did during my postdoctoral stage in Geoscience Montpellier. This study was an effort between Andrea and myself, both from Geoscience Montpellier and Maureen and Thomas from the University of Grenoble Alps. Our motivation to do this is that we are very interested in studying how the strain field, the microstructure and the crystallographic preferred orientation evolve over time during plastic deformation in aggregates to understand two processes, dynamic recrystallization and strain localization. One of the material we use for this was common ice or ice one H. And um, there are many good reasons to study the formation in common ice, but here I like to stress two. First, it is a low symmetry hexagonal material with a strong viscoplastic anisotropy uh, that deform mainly through basal glide, uh, being non basal glide around 60 times harder to activate and uh, very prone to recrystallize during deformation. It shares all these features with many of the main rock forming minerals that make up the lithosphere and this makes ice a good model material with the advantage that it requires much lower temperatures and stresses than silicates to flow. Secondly, it allows the preparation of samples with columnar grains as shown here in this image where there is a single grain from the bottom to the top of the sample and the grain boundaries are arranged uh, approximately perpendicular to the observation surface, which facilitates a lot the interpretation of the microstructures and the relation between grains and so on. To summarize the creep experiments, first of all, we made ice samples of 10 by 10 by 1.5 centimeters from columnar ice blocks. Before deformation, we generated a random pattern on the sample surface, which will allow us to estimate and follow the strain field during creep using uh, digital image correlation techniques. And, um, and then place the samples in a creep press at minus seven degrees Celsius degrees, very close to the ice melting temperature and a stress of 0 0.5 uh, megapascals. We set the ideal light and imaging conditions and once the creep test starts we may we take an image every 10 minutes. The experiment lasts between one and two days. Uh, for each experiment we make two thin sections, one before and one after the formation to make crystallographic orientation maps of the axis using a fabric analyzer uh, device and also optical images. Here I will present uh, the evolution of two different samples. Sample A was deformed up to a shortening of 3.1% in a one-day experiment and dynamic crystallization was rather limited, mainly confined along this uh, grain boundary here. The particularity with this sample is that it presents two grains with a much larger size than the rest the one uh, referred to as grain number one right in the middle and the grain number two right underneath. In addition, these grains show moderate to low Smith factor values in orange and red tones here to activate a basal glide, which means that these grains are not well oriented to allow an easy basal glide uh, deformation. The direction of the basal planes on the observation surface is indicated with these white lines. It should be noted here, however, that the Smith factor is essentially a proxy for single crystal analysis as the stress direction can vary locally in a, pro in a polycrystal, uh, but it serves as a reference. Sample B was the format up to 9.5% in a two-day creep experiment with a good development of dynamic recrystallization almost affecting all grain boundaries. In this case, the grain size is more homogeneous than in sample A, although uh, large, consisting of a few grains along the shortening axis in the vertical direction. 
In this case, the Smith factor values for uh, activating basal sleep vary a lot with grains 1, 4 and 6 in blue colors uh, very well oriented to trigger basal light. As a reference, I illustrate here the macroscopic Greek curves for both samples showing two types of data based on the longitudinal strain and based on the average strain estimated over the entire deformation field in the shortening direction. In both cases, the strain rates fall off rapidly at a value of around 2 to the minus 7. Uh, in sample A, it reached a steady state until the end of the experiment at a shortening of 3.1%, while in sample B, the strain rate increases monotonically, reaching a peak strain rate at a bulk shortening of 2.9% to start decreasing gradually until the end of the experiment at a shortening of 9.5%, so that after the initial decrease, sample B went through a weakening a weakening and then a hardening stage, which is otherwise a common behavior in ice. To illustrate the evolution of the strain field, we use uh, the bone misses equivalent strain, which is this equation here that combines the different components of the two-dimensional strain field. The equivalent strain is represented normalized by the median strain, and using a logarithmic scale so that values uh, up to 1 here in blue tones represent areas strained below the average while values above uh, 1 up to 10 here in red tone represent strain values above the average and therefore strain localization. Unless explicitly stated, all map illustrated here uh, is what we call incremental strain maps, that is the, accumula the accumulated strain in 10 minutes of grip. In any case, the microscopic finite strain is always indicated in the top right corner of the map. Let us now focus on the evolution of the strain field for the sample V in the weakening stage. The first thing to note is that at the very beginning, the strain locates in the vicinity of almost all grain boundaries. This is, however, a transitory phenomenon that disappears quickly, as will be seen next. Then, strain begins to concentrate in a few shear bands that eventually spread over multiple grains. Also, note that a crack occurs in a grain number 2 after the development of the shear bands, when macroscopic shortening was about 1.4%. Now, uh, let's focus on the development of the shear bands and their transfer across the grains. First, we have three basal shear bands developed in grains 1, 4 and 6, precisely those with a high Smith factor values for basal glide. The basal shear band at the top left transfers to the, through the grain number 2 in a somewhat uh, non-basal diffuse uh, way, generating a crack at some point. The basal shear band in grain number 4 stops at the contact between grains 4 and 5, where it fades away. The most remarkable uh, feature is that these basal shear zones are invisible in the polarized optical images or the orientation maps, indicating that they left no trace in the form of orientation gradients. In contrast to this, non-basal shear bands do leave a clear imprint on the microstructure. Now, I want you to focus at these two areas with severe recrystallization. The one at the top developed in grain number 2 and the other at the interface between grains 4 and 5. Uh, these areas correspond to transfer shear uh, zones where basal uh, propagation is uh, difficult or not possible. Sample A also showed the same initial transient stage with strain localized along all grain boundaries. In this case, strain localization persisted at the grain boundary where most of the dynamic recrystallization developed. Uh, most of the strain, however, was accommodated by the shear band that crosses the entire sample right in the middle. 
and to a lesser extent in this small curve shear band uh, within grain number two that arises from a change in a grain boundary orientation. In the case of the shear band crossing the sample, it corresponds mainly to a basal shear band developed in a grain uh, number one at a high angle to the shortening direction. This shear band transfers to the neighboring grains as a non basal shear band, and once again, basal glide left no imprint inside the grain but at the grain boundaries. In contrast, non basal shear band left a clear imprint in the microstructure. For example, subgrains and recrystallization developed along the non basal curved shear band located at the bottom. To conclude, the take home messages are as follows. Firstly, we have documented the decoupling between the finite strain and the microstructural record at the grain scale. In particular, for ice, the decoupling between the development of the basal shear bands and the intragranular distortion of the crystal lattice, usually measured as a misorientation gradient. The first implication of this decoupling is that orientation gradients due to lattice distortion do not measure strain intensity at the local scale. Consequently, we should be cautious uh, when correlating EBSD-based misorientation proxies like the kernel average misorientation or the grain orientation spread and the like with strain intensity at the grain or smaller scales. Our hypothesis to explain this is that in many cases basal dislocations in ice progresses freely across the grain, changing its shape but leaving no intracrystalline orientation gradients. Uh, to generalize this hypothesis, this is due to the unimpeded dislocation glide of selected slip systems. Such an impeded dislocation gliding has recently been observed in other low symmetry materials such as olivine. For example, in this study, the authors deformed olivine single crystal oriented uh, differently to activate a different slip system and observed that when activating the most common one, the 100010, observed a lack of grains in contrast to when they activated other sliding system, interpreting a dislocation of this type as moving mainly unimpeded through the crystal. Another stunning example has also been observed uh, recently in high symmetry cubic materials such as nickel superalloys uh, in these studies indicated here. Uh, using high resolution digital image correlation, which means resolutions down to nanometric scale, these authors were capable of serving three different sets of individual slip bands at the individual grain scale, at least this sample, and when comparing the accumulated coarsened plastic strain and the internal misorientation measured with EBSD after 2% of deformation, they observed this decoupling too. Indeed, in this sample, most of the intragranular lattice distortion accumulated in the less strained area of the grain, and the slip bands that dominate generated virtually no intercrystalline distortion. The implication of this unimpeded dislocation glide of selected uh, slip system is that the proportion of the dislocation types within subgrains dots not uh, measure the relative contribution of different slip system to the formation. This finding allow us to solve a recent paradox in the ice community, which was the observation of the high occurrence up to 40% of non-basal dislocation in subgrains of naturally and experimentally deformed ice, reported in these studies here. And according to this, the paradox is simple and apparent one. Lastly, under the experimental condition tested, dynamic recrystallization did not favor strain localization, as is commonly assumed in air science, but rather accommodated uh, strain compatibility. Thanks for watching.